Hare Krishna everyone, welcome back to the live studios. This time we're here in Wisteria House, uh, Cottage, just outside of Folkestone, UK, Kent, UK. And we're here with Shama Gauri, Devi Dasi, who's the best cook in the world, and Priya Kund, Devi Dasi, the two of them, husband and wife, run a very nice preaching center and shop here in Folkestone and they do the work of 12 people don't try to replace them and I'm here also with Matt Bell, Bell Roberts my new traveling companion who's helping keeping me together and uh, doing his thing and getting trained at the same time so we're all happy like three four bugs in a rug over here it's beautiful we are, first, before I start tonight, and by the way, welcome to all of you out there in, in cyberspace. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being my friend. Hare Krishna. Okay, we are, I'm going to read to you something from Srila Prabhupada direct. How important it is to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. You know I'm into this, right? So this is actually in the second canto also. Uh, second chapter, verse 30, purport, where Srila Prabhupada says, when we speak of hearing and chanting, it means that not, not only should one chant and hear the holy name of the Lord as Rama Krishna, or systematically as the 16 names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama Hare Hare but one should also read and hear the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam in the association of devotees and here we are every night this primary practice of bhakti yoga will cause the seed already sowed in the heart to sprout and a regular watering as, and by a regular watering process as mentioned above the bhakti yoga creeper will begin to grow by systematic nurturing, the creeper will grow to such an extent that it will penetrate the coverings of the universe, as we have heard in the previous verses. So this is direct from Prabhupada, and it's many, many places, but I did that, that quote particularly struck me, how the chanting leads to the Bhagavatam, and we have to do both regularly in order to actually water the seeds properly, seed of bhakti properly and cultivate the seed of the, the bhakti plant, the creeper of devotion. Okay, before we start our reading tonight, we're going to do what we always do every day, and we're going to read Sanatana Goswami's <clears throat> beautiful and profound, deep uh, glorification of the Srimad Bhagavatam. It goes like this. Sarva Shastrabdi Piyusha Sarva Vedaika Satpala Sarva Siddhanta Ratnaja Sarva Lokaika Drikprada O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana Srimad Bhagavata Prabho Kalidvandodita Ditya Sri Krishna Parivartita O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master Srimad Bhagavatam, you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya Prema Varshaksharayate Sarvadasavasevyaya Sri Krishna Yanamostume I bow down to you, who are supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna himself. Marek bando mat sangin, mat guru man mahadana, man nishtaraka mat bhagya, mat ananda namostute. My only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, 
my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. Asadu sadhu dayin atini chochata kada hanamun chikadachin mam prem narit kata yospura. O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Move this over here. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. We just finished hearing the questions that Maharaj Parikshit asked Shukadeva Goswami before, just before he launched into the full recital of the Bhagavatam. Uh, and these questions were so advanced, there were so many of them, and they covered so many topics and subject matters that you can understand this is not a, this is a person que questioning who already knows everything. You can't ask that, those, that many questions so deeply about something unless you know about that thing. So I thought that was very wonderful. We, we actually read yesterday the uh, first verse of the ninth chapter, but I'm going to go back and start again from, the, from, a chap from verse 1, from this new chapter we are reading, which is titled, Answers by citing the Lord's version. You know, when we get answered questions in the material world, we, we always answer according to our version. But here, Shukadev Goswami is going to answer Maharaj Prikshit's questions uh, by citing the Lord's version. And that's what transcendental literature does. Okay, chapter 9. Answers by citing the Lord's version. Chap text 1. <clears throat> Sri Shukadeva Goswami said, O King, unless one is influenced by the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there is no meaning to the relationship of the pure soul in pure consciousness with the material body. That relationship is just like a dreamer's seeing his own body working. Purport. Maharaj Parikshit's question as to how a living entity began his material life, although he is apart from the material body and mind, is perfectly answered. The spirit soul is distinct from the material conception of his life, but he is absorbed in such a material conception because of being influenced by the external energy of the Lord called Atma Maya. This has already been explained in the first canto in connection with Vyasadeva's realization of the Supreme Lord and his external energy. The external energy is controlled by the Lord and the living entities are controlled by the external energy, by the will of the Lord. Therefore, although the living entity is purely conscious in his pure state, he is subordinate to the will of the Lord in being influenced by the external energy of the Lord. In the Bhagavad Gita 1515 also, <clears throat> the same thing is confirmed. The Lord is present within the heart of every living entity, and all the living entities' consciousness and forgetfulness are influenced by the Lord. Now the next question automatically made will be why the Lord influences the living entity to such consciousness and forgetfulness. The answer is that the Lord clearly wishes that every living entity be in his pure consciousness as a part and parcel of the Lord and thus be engaged in the loving service of your Lord as he is constitutionally made. But because the living entity is partially independent also, he may not be willing to serve the Lord but may try to become as independent as the Lord is. 
all the, not all the non-devotee living entities are desirous of becoming equally as powerful as the Lord, although they are not fit to become so. The living entities are illusioned by the will of the Lord because they wanted to become like Him. I'll repeat that again, thank you. The living entities are illusioned by the will of the Lord because they wanted to become like Him. Like a person who thinks of becoming a king without possessing the necessary qualification. When, a living, when the living entity desires to become the Lord himself, he is put into a condition of dreaming that he is a king. And the consequent, and therefore, the first sinful will of the living entity is to become the Lord. And the consequent will of the Lord is that the living entity forget his factual life and thus dream of the land of utopia where he may become one, one like the Lord. The child cries to have the moon from the mother. And the mother gives the child a mirror to satisfy the crying and disturbing child with the reflection of the moon. Similarly, the crying child of the Lord is given over to the reflection, the material world, to lord it over as a karmi and to give this up in frustration to become one with the Lord. Both these stages are dreaming illusions only. There is no necessity of tracing out the history when the living entity desired this. But the, I'll repeat that again. There is no necessity of tracing out the history of when the living entity desired this. But the fact is that as soon as he desired it, he was put under the control of Atma Maya by the direction of the Lord. Therefore, the living entity in his material condition is dreaming falsely that this is mine and this is I. The dream is, the dream is that the conditioned soul thinks of his material body as I or falsely thinks that he is the Lord and that everything in connection with the material body is mine. Thus, only in dream does the misconception of I and mine persist life after life. This continues life after life as long as the living entity is not purely conscious of his identity as the subordinate part and parcel of the Lord. In his pure consciousness, however, there is no such misconceived dream. And in that pure conscious state, the living entity does not forget that he is never the Lord, but is eternally the servitor of the Lord in transcendental love. Text 2. <clears throat> the illusion living entity appears in so many, many forms offered by the external energy of the Lord while enjoying in the modes of material nature, the encaged living entity misconceives thinking in terms of I and mine, purport. The different forms of the living entities are different dresses offered by the illusory external energy of the Lord according to the modes of nature the living being desires to enjoy. The external material energy is represented by her three modes namely goodness, passion, and ignorance. So even in the material nature, there is a chance of an independent choice by the living entity. And according to his choice, the material energy offers him different varieties of material bodies. There are 900,000 varieties of material bodies in the water, 2 million vegetable bodies, 1,100,000 worms and reptiles, 1 million forms of birds, three million different bodies of beasts, and 400,000 human forms. Altogether, there are, there are 8,400,000 varieties of bodies in different planets of the universe, and the living entity is traveling by so many transmigrations according to different modes of the enjoying spirit within himself. Even in one particular body, the living entity changes from childhood to boyhood, from boyhood to youth, from youth to old age, and from old age to another body created by his own action. 
the living entity creates his own body by his personal desires, and the external energy of the Lord supplies him the exact form by which he can enjoy his desires to the fullest extent. The tiger wanted to enjoy the blood of another animal, and therefore, by the grace of the Lord, the material energy supplied him, the body of the tiger, with facilities for enjoying blood from another animal. Similarly, a living entity desiring to get the body of a demigod in a higher planet can also get it by the grace of the Lord. And if he's intelligent enough, he can desire to get a spiritual body to enjoy the company of the Lord, and he will get it. So the, so the minute freedom of the living entity can be fully utilized. And the Lord is so kind that he will award the living entity the same type of body he desires. The living entity's desiring is like dreaming of a golden mountain. A person knows what a mountain is, and he also knows what gold is. Out of his desire only, he dreams of a golden mountain. And when the dream is over, he sees something else in his presence. He finds in his awakened state that there is neither gold nor a mountain, and what to speak of a golden mountain. The different positions of the living entities in the material world under multifarious manifestations of bodies are due to the misconception of mine and I. The karmi thinks this world is mine, and the jnani thinks I am everything. The whole material conception of politics, sociology, philanthropy, altruism, and so on, conceived, of, conceived by the conditioned souls, is on the basis of this misconceived I and mine, which are products of a strong desire to enjoy material life. Identification with the body and, and the place where the body is obtained under different conditions of socialism, nationalism, family affection, and so on and so forth, is all due to forgetfulness of the real nature of the living entity. And the whole misconception of the bewildered living entity can be removed by the association of Shukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Prikshit, as all this is explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Text 3. As soon as the living entity becomes situated in his constitutional glory and begins to enjoy the transcendence beyond time and material energy, he at once gives up the two misconceptions of life, I and mine, and thus becomes fully manifested as the pure self. Purport. The two misconceptions of life, namely I and mine, are verily manifested in two classes of men. In the lower state, the misconception of mine is very prominent, and in the higher state, the misconception of I is prominent. In the animal state of life, the misconception of mine is perceivable even in the category of cats and dogs who fight with one another with the same misconception of mine. In the lower stage of human life, the same misconception is also prominent in the shape of it is my body, it is my house, it is my family, it is my caste, it is my nation, it is my country, and so on. And in the highest, higher stage of speculative knowledge, the same misconception of mind is transformed into I am, or I am all, etc. There are many classes of men comprehending the same misconception of I and mind in different colors. But the real significance of I can be realized only when one is situated in the consciousness of I am the eternal servitor of the Lord. This is pure consciousness. And all the Vedic literatures teach us this conception of life. The, mis the misconception of I am the Lord or I am the Supreme is more dangerous than the misconception of mine. Although there are sometimes directions in the Vedic literatures to think oneself one with the Lord, that does not mean that one becomes identical with the Lord in every respect. Undoubtedly, there is oneness of the living entity with the Lord in many respects. But ultimately, the living entity is subordinate to the Lord 
and he is constitutionally meant for satisfying the senses of the Lord. The Lord therefore asks the conditioned souls to surrender unto him. Had the living entities not been subordinate to the supreme will, why would the living entity be asked to surrender? Had the living entity been equal in all respects, then why was he put under the influence of Maya? We have already discussed many times that the material energy is controlled by the Lord. The Bhagavad Gita 9.10 confirms this controlling power of the Lord over the material nature. Can a living entity who claims to be as good as the Supreme Being control the material nature? The foolish I would reply that he will do so in the future. Even accepting that in the future one will be as good as a, as, as good a controller of material nature as the Supreme Being, then why is one now under the control of material nature? The Bhagavad Gita says, that one can be freed from the control of the material nature by surrendering under the Supreme Lord. But if there is no surrender, then the living entity will never be able to control the material nature. So one must also give up this misconception of I by practicing the way of devotional service and becoming firmly situated in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. A poor man without any employment or occupation, may undergo so many troubles in life, but if by chance the same man gets a good service under the government, he, is at one, he at once becomes happy. There is no profit in denying the supremacy of the Lord, who is the controller of all energies, but one should be constitutionally situated in one's own glory, namely, to be situated in the pure consciousness of being the eternal servitor of the Lord. In his conditional life, the living entity is the servant of the illusory maya, and in his liberated state, he is the pure, unqualified servant of the Lord. To become un untinged by the modes of material nature is the qualification for entering into the service of the Lord. As long as one is a servant of mental concoctions, one cannot be completely free from the disease of I and mine. The supreme truth is uncontaminated by the illusory energy because he is the controller of that energy. The relative truths are apt to be engrossed in the illusory energy. The best purpose is served, however, when one is directly facing the supreme truth as when one faces the sun. The sun overhead in the sky is full of light but when the sun is not in the visible sky, all is in darkness. Similarly, when one is face to face with the Supreme Lord, he is freed from all illusions, and one who is not so is in the darkness of illusory maya. The Bhagavad Gita 1426 confirms this as follows. Mam chayo vyabicharina bhakti yogena sevate sagunan Samati Jaitan, Brahma Bhuyaya, Kalpate. So the science of Bhakti Yoga, of worshipping the Lord, glorifying the Lord, hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam from the right sources, not from the professional man, but from, a, from, but from a person who is Bhagavatam in life, and being always in the association of pure devotees, should be adopted in earnestness. I'll read that again. This is a very important sentence. Very important sentence. So the science of bhakti yoga, of worshipping the Lord, glorifying the Lord, hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam from the right sources, not from the professional man, but from a person who is Bhagavatam in life, and being always in the association of pure devotees, should be adopted in earnestness. One should not be misled by misconceptions of I and mine. The karmis are fond of the conception of mine. The jnanis are fond of the conception of I. And both of them are unqualified to be free from the bondage of the illusory energy. 
Srimad Bhagavatam and primarily the Bhagavad Gita are both meant for delivering a person from the misconception of I and mine. And Srila Vyasadeva transcribed them for the deliverance of the fallen souls. The living entity has to be situated in the transcendental position where there is no longer any influence of time or the material energy. In conditional, conditioned life, the living entity is subjected to the influence of time in the dream of past, present, and future. The mental speculator tries to conquer the influence of time by speculating about becoming Vasudeva or the Supreme Lord. In the future, by means of culturing knowledge and conquering over ego, but the process is not perfect. The perfect process is to accept Lord Vasudeva as the supreme in everything, and the best perfection in culturing knowledge is to surrender unto him, because he is the source of everything. Only in that conception can one get rid of the misconception of I and mine. Both the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam confirm it. Srila Vyasadeva has specifically contributed to the illusion living entities, the science of God, and the process of Bhakti Yoga. In his great literature, Srimad Bhagavatam, and the conditioned soul should fully take advantage of this great science. Text 4. O King, the Personality of Godhead <clears throat> being very much pleased with Lord, Bra with, with Lord Brahma because of his non-deceptive penance in Bhakti Yoga, presented his eternal and transcendental form before Brahma. And that is the objective goal for purifying the conditioned soul. Report. Atma Tattva is the science of both God and the living entity. Both the Supreme Lord and the living entity are known as Atma. The Supreme Lord is called Paramatma and the living entity is called the Atma, the Brahma or the Jiva. Both the Paramatma and the Jivatma, being transcendental to the material nature, are called Atma. So Shukadeva Goswami speaks this verse with the aim of purifying the truth of both the Paramatma and the Jivatma. Generally, people have many wrong conceptions about both of them. <clears throat> the wrong conception of the Jivatma is to identify the material body with the pure soul, and the wrong conception of Paramatma is to think him on an equal level with the living entity. But both misconceptions can be removed by the one stroke of bhakti yoga. Just as in the sunlight, both the sun and the world and everything within the sunlight are properly seen. In the darkness, one cannot see the sun, nor himself, nor the world. But in the sunlight, one can see the sun, himself, and the world around him. Srila Shukadeva Goswami therefore says, that for purification of both wrong conceptions, the Lord presented his eternal form before Brahmaji, being fully satisfied by Brahma's non-deceptive vow of discharging Bhakti Yoga. Except for Bhakti Yoga, any method of realization of Atma Tattva or the science of Atma will prove deceptive in the long run. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that only the Bhakti Yoga and only by Bhakti Yoga can one know him perfectly and then one can enter into the science of God. Brahmaji undertook great penance in performing Bhakti Yoga and thus he was able to see the transcendental form of the Lord. His transcendental form is 100% spiritual and one can see him only by spiritualized vision after proper discharge of tapasya or penance in pure bhakti yoga. The form of the Lord manifested before Brahma is not one of the forms 
with which we have experience in the material world. Brahmaji did not perform such severe types of penance just to see a form of material production. Therefore, the question by Maharaj Pariksit about the form of the Lord is answered. The form of the Lord is Satchidananda, or eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. But the material form of a living being is neither eternal, nor full of knowledge, nor blissful. That is the distinction between the form of the Lord and that of the conditioned soul. The conditioned soul, however, can regain his form of eternal knowledge and bliss simply by seeing the Lord by means of bhakti yoga. The summary is that due to ignorance, the conditioned soul is encaged in the temporary varieties of material forms. But the Supreme Lord has no such temporary form like the conditioned souls. He is always possessed of an eternal form of knowledge and bliss. And that is the difference between the Lord and the living entity. One can understand this difference by the process of bhakti yoga. Brahma was then told by the Lord the gist of Srimad Bhagavatam in four original verses. Thus, Srimad Bhagavatam is not a, a creation of the mental speculators. The sound of Srimad Bhagavatam is transcendental, and the resonance of Srimad Bhagavatam is as good as that of the Vedas. <clears throat> Thus, the topic of the Srimad Bhagavatam is the science of both the Lord and the living entity. Ray Bhagavatam is also performance of bhakti yoga. Shall I repeat that? <laughs> These are all recorded, you know. We're actually recording all the times that Prabhupada said this for posterity. Regular reading or hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam is also performance of bhakti yoga. And one can attain the highest perfection simply by the association of Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. Don't mind. I'm going to very quickly put this in my... I'm, I'm making up my research for next year's offering. It's going to be part three. Right? And I'm going to include this one because this is really a good one. Right? Completely explicit. Amazing. How? I'm getting an idea that people stop reading Prabhupada's books because if they do, if they don't, they'll have to do this. <laughs> right? Srimad Bhagavatam. Two nine, what verse is it? Four purport. Huh? And the yes, thank you. Good point. Thank you. <clears throat> Both Shukadev Goswami and Maharaj Pariksit attained perfection through the medium of Srimad Bhagavatam. Text 5. Lord Brahma, the first spiritual master, supreme in the universe, could not trace out the source of his lotus seat. And while thinking of creating the material world, he could not understand the proper direction for such creative work, nor could he find out the process for such creation. Purport. This verse is the prelude for explaining the transcendental nature of the form and the abode of the Lord. In the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, it has already been said that the Supreme Absolute Truth exists in its own abode without any touch of the deluding energy. Therefore, the kingdom of God is not a myth, but factually a different and transcendental sphere of planets known as the Vaikuntas. This will also be explained in this chapter. Such knowledge of the spiritual sky far above this material sky and its paraphernalia 
can be known only by dint of devotional service or bhakti yoga. The power of creation by Lord Brahma was also achieved by bhakti yoga. Brahmaji was bewildered in the matter of creation and he could not even trace out the source of his own existence. But all this knowledge was fully achieved by him through the medium of bhakti yoga. By bhakti yoga, one can know the Lord. And by knowing the Lord as the Supreme, one is able to know everything else. One who knows the Supreme knows everything else. That is the version of all the Vedas. Even the spiritual, first spiritual master of the universe was enlightened by the grace of the Lord. So who else can attain perfect knowledge of everything without the mercy of the Lord? If anyone desires to seek perfect knowledge of everything, he must seek the mercy of the Lord. And there is no other means, not even Siri. <laughs> To seek knowledge of the strength of one's personal attempt is a sheer waste of time. Text 6. While thus engaged in thinking, Brahmaji heard twice from nearby in the, wa in the water two sil syllables joined together. One of the syllables was the 16th and the other the 21st of the Sparsha letters and they join to become the wealth of the renounced order of life. Purport. In the Sanskrit language, the continents are divided into two groups, namely the Sparsha Varnas and the Talavya Varnas. From Ka to Ma, the letters are known as the Sparsha Varnas, and the 16th of the group is Ta, whereas the 21st letter is Pa. So when they are joined together, the word Tapa, or penance is constructed. This penance is the beauty and wealth of the brahmanas and the renounced order of life. According to Bhagavata philosophy, every human being is meant simply for this tapa and for no other business, because by penance only can one realize the, his self and self-realization, not sense gratification. I'll read that again, sorry. According to Bhagavata philosophy, every human being is meant simply for this tapa and for no other business, because by penance only can one realize his self. And self-realization, not sense gratification, is the business of human life. This tapa, or penance, was begun from the very beginning of the creation, and it was first adopted by the Supreme Spiritual Master, Lord Brahma. By tapasya only, one can get the profit of human life, and not by a polished civilization of animal life. The animal does not know anything except sense gratification, and the jurisdiction of eat, drink, be merry, and enjoy. But the human being is made to undergo tapasya for going back to Godhead, back home. When Lord Brahma was perplexed, about how to construct the material manifestation in the universe and went down within the water to find out the means and the source of his lotus seat, he heard the word tapa vibrated twice. Taking the path of tapa is the second birth of the desiring disciple. The word upashrinot, upash, upashrinot is very significant. It is similar to upanayana, or bringing the disciple nearer to the spiritual master for the, for the path of tapa. So Brahmaji was thus initiated by Lord Krishna, and this fact is corroborated by Brahmaji himself in his book, the Brahma Samhita. In the Brahma Samhita, Lord Brahma has sung in every verse, Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bajami. Thus Brahma was initiated into the Krishna mantra by Lord Krishna himself, and thus he became a Vaishnava, or a devotee of the Lord, before he was able to construct the huge universe. It is stated in the, before he was able to construct the huge, I'll read that again. Thus Brahma was initiated 
into the Krishna mantra by Lord Krishna himself. And thus he became a Vaishnava, or a devotee of the Lord, because he was able to construct, before he was able to construct the huge universe. It is stated in the Brahma Samhita that Lord Brahma was initiated into the 18-letter Krishna mantra, which is generally accepted by all the devotees of Lord Krishna. We follow the same principle because we belong to the Brahma Sampradaya directly in the disciplic chain from Brahma to Narada, from Narada to Vyasa, from Vyasa to Madhvamuni, from Madhvamuni to Madhavinda Puri, from Madhavinda Puri to Ishwara Puri, from Ishwara Puri to Lord Chaitanya, and gradually to His Divine Grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, our Divine Master. One who is thus initiated in the disciplic succession is able to achieve the same result or power of creation. Chanting of this holy mantra is the only shelter of the desireless pure devotee of the Lord. Simply by such tapasya or penance, the devotee of the Lord achieves all perfections like Lord Brahma. Text 7. <clears throat> when he heard the sound, he tried to find the speaker, searching on all sides. But when he was unable to find anyone besides himself, he thought it wise to sit down on his lotus feet firmly and give his attention to execution of penance as he was instructed. Purport. To achieve success in life, one should follow the example of Lord Brahma, the first living creature in the beginning of creation. After being initiated by the Supreme Lord to execute tapasya, he was fixed in his determination to do it. And although he could not find anyone besides himself, he could rightly understand that the sound was transmitted by Lord, the Lord himself. Brahma was the only living being at that time because there was no other creation and no one could be found there except him. In the beginning of the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the first chapter, first verse, it has already been mentioned that Brahma was initiated by the Lord from within. The Lord is within every living entity as the super soul, and he initiated Brahma because Brahma was willing to receive the initiation. The Lord can similarly initiate everyone who is inclined to have it. As already stated, Brahma is the original spiritual master for the universe, and since he was initiated by the Lord himself, the message of Srimad Bhagavatam is coming down by disciplic succession. And in order to receive the real message of Srimad Bhagavatam, one should approach the current link or spiritual master in the chain of disciplic succession. After being initiated by the proper spiritual master in that chain of succession, one should engage himself in the discharge of tapasya, in the execution of devotional service. One should not, however, think himself on the level of Brahma to be initiated directly by the Lord from inside, because in the present age, no one can be accepted to be pure, to be as pure as Brahma. The post of Brahma <clears throat> to officiate in the creation of the universe is offered to the most pure living being. And unless one is so qualified, one cannot expect to be treated like Brahmaji directly. But one can have the same facility through unalloyed devotees of the Lord, through scriptural instructions as revealed in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam especially, and also through the bona fide spiritual master available to the sincere soul the Lord himself appears as the spiritual master to a person who is sincere in heart about serving the Lord. Therefore, the bona fide spiritual master who happens to meet the sincere devotee should be accepted as the most confidential and beloved representative of the Lord. If a person is posted under the guidance of such a bona fide spiritual master, it may be accepted without any doubt that the desiring person has achieved the grace of the Lord. Text 8.
Lord Brahma <clears throat> underwent penances for 1,000 years by the calculations of the demigods. He heard this transcendental vibration from the sky and he accepted it as divine. The ducks. You hear the ducks quacking? Lots of dogs. In between the dogs, there was a duck. Maybe he was trying to get away from the dog. Anyway. <laughs> Thus he controlled the mind and senses, and the penances he executed were a great lesson for the living entities. Thus he is known as the greatest of all ascetics. Purport. Lord Brahma heard the occult sound, tapa, but he did not see the person who vibrated the sound. And still he accepted the instruction as beneficial for him, and therefore he engaged himself in meditation for 1,000 celestial years. You want to get perfection through meditation? You got to do it for 1,000 celestial years. That's it. That's it. That's all you got to do. Because that means you got to attain a lifetime that length. And 1,000 celestial years is a long time. I mean, one day of Brahma is 8,600,000,000 years. Anyway, we won't bother to calculate. It's a lot. One celestial year is equal to 6 times 30 times 12 times 1,000 of our years. His acceptance of the sound was due to his pure vision of the absolute nature of the Lord. And due to his correct vision, he made no distinction between the Lord and the Lord's instruction. There is no difference between the Lord and the sound vibration coming from him, even though he is not personally present. The best way of understanding is to accept such divine instruction. And Brahma, the prime spiritual master of everyone, is the living example of this process of receiving transcendental knowledge. The potency of transcendental sound is never minimized because the vibrator is apparently absent. Therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita or any other revealed scripture in the world is never to be accepted as an ordinary, mundane sound without transcendental potency. See, this, this last sentence reveals the uh, universal uh, nature of Krishna consciousness because there's no other scripture in the world that will acknowledge the other scriptures of the world like this. <laughs> Here it says, therefore the Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita or any other revealed scripture of the world is never to be accepted as an ordinary mundane sound without transcendental potency. And in that sentence, Prabhupada cuts across this sectarian view and delivers the absolute truth. One has to receive the transcendental sound from the right source, accept it as a reality, and prosecute the direction without hesitation. The secret of success is to receive the sound from the right source, a bona fide spiritual master. Mundane manufactured sound has no potency, and as such, seemingly transcendental sound received from an authorized person also has no potency. Excuse me, I, I read that wrong. Mundane manufactured sound has no potency, and as such, seemingly transcendental sound received from an unauthorized person also has no potency. One should be qualified enough to discern such transcendental potency, and either by discriminating or by fortunate chance, if one is able to receive the transcendental sound from the bona fide spiritual master, the, his path of liberation is guaranteed. The disciple, however, must be ready to execute the order of the bona fide spiritual master, as Lord Brahma executed the instruction of his spiritual master, the Lord himself. Following the order of the bona fide spiritual master is the only duty of the disciple, and th this completely faithful execution of the order of the bona fide spiritual master is the secret of success. Lord Brahma controlled his two grades of senses, 
namely his senses of perception and his organs of action, because he had to engage them in the execution of the order of the Lord. The Lord's order descends in disciplic succession through the bona fide spiritual master and his faction. The Lord's order descends in disciplic succession through the bona fide spiritual master and thus execution of the order of the bona fide spiritual master is factual control of the senses. Such execution of penance in full faith and sincerity made Brahmaji so powerful that he became the creator of the universe. And because he was able to attain such power, he is called the best amongst all the tapasvis. And we'll stop there for tonight. So we will now open it up to the delightful portion of our program, and that is reflections. Anything that came into the mind, that stuck in the mind, that one wants to hear, either hear again or reflect on, or question, or elaborate upon, please feel free. Yes, Bhakti Matt. Reflection. Reflection. <laughs> In, uh, in a previous life, when I was, you know, um, heavily involved in Christianity, the thought of the way that heaven was put forward to me honestly didn't sound like a lot of fun. It was just a lot of, like, they said, you're just going to be there and, and worshiping all the time. But understanding in terms of Krishna consciousness and the different planets and these different things, um, developing a heart for devotional service becomes really enjoyable mm -hmm. and to be able to be engaged in devotional service to the Lord directly becomes like the highest pleasure that one can gain so going to those planets is actually something that someone would look forward to Amen brother <laughs> this is my thought Amen brother that's what they should be teaching in the, in the Christian churches. Yeah. I mean, actually, that was Jesus' message. You know, he said, oh, go out and become pure as, if, as your father is pure. Mm -hmm. It's directly in the Bible. And they just, they just ignore that. Mm -hmm. And somebody got in there and fidgeted, fiddled with the thing, some politicians or whoever. And now it's just for me and for prosperity, that's it. No, no conception of an actual personal relationship, personal loving relationship with God. It's not there. So is it the fear? fear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Prabhupada said that if a person is following the teachings, he can get go forward in spiritual life, Christ's teachings. But they're not, so what's the question? It's like hypothetical. It's like a moot point, you know. Mm. Yeah, you need to have that relationship. Mm. So they, they, they don't have that concept that being able to have it with God. Yeah. So then they, they move it on to Jesus. Yes. And somehow, over time, Jesus became God. Yes. And then because with Jesus, you can have some kind of relationship. Yes. Relationship. Yes. But the actual original God is too distant. Yes. You know, too too high, too not high, just too inconceivable. They can't yeah. conceive of it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and a little bit like fearful that when it comes through the Bible. Well, it, it's interesting, you know, because if you if you actually interpret the Bible properly, mm -hmm. properly, it's the same, mm -hmm. because Jesus said, "I and my Father are one," mm -hmm. but they want to make it the same person. Yeah. But I and my Father, or how you know. Uh, what is it? Uh, what is the beginning of the Lord's Prayer? Uh, How you been yeah, no, before, before that. Uh, uh, Our Father, Father are who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Mm -hmm. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. Mm -hmm. But then he says, I am my Father. One means I'm saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. What I say is the same as what my Father says, therefore we're the same. So that's what Prabhupada is saying also here in these, in these last explanations of the relationship with the spiritual master and the disciple. 
if you take the spiritual master as actually representative of Krishna, it's just, and he said even the same thing you said here. He said because you can have a relationship with the spiritual master, and having a relationship with God is, you know, very very difficult, more difficult, and that's the mercy of the spiritual master, and it's the mercy of Krishna. Yasya prasada bhagavat prasado, yasya prasada nagati kadopi. By the mercy of the spiritual master, you get Krishna. By the, by the mercy of Krishna, you get the spiritual master. By the mercy of the spiritual master, you get Krishna. So it's actually the same. But the, it's, all, it's all been twisted and perverted and, you know. I heard Gopi Puranadhanapu say a very nice thing. He was talking about the different divisions of devotional service, you know, Kanishta and Madhyam and Uttama. And he said, the Kanishta serves out of fear. And the Madhyam serves out of duty and out of gratitude. And the Uttama serves out of love. Beautiful. Very simple, very beautiful distinction, how to understand the different levels of devotional service. But we shouldn't denigrate the third class devotees, because even though they're not full devotees yet, they're so much better than persons who are not approaching God, therefore they should be considered to be nice, good, you know. Udaret Atman, Udaret, what is that? Udara Sarvat. Udara Sarva Eva Sarva. Yani Tvatma Vame Mantam. Astita Yoga Yuktatma. Ma Me Ma Nuktamam Gatim. All those persons, all those persons means the ones who are conditioned, need of money, distressed, curious, searchers. They have, they, they're approaching. And Krishna says, all of them are magnanimous. Udara means magnanimous. So we shouldn't think one's magnanimous and one's not. But then Krishna says, but one who starts out looking for the truth and is doing it because he's found the truth, that person is especially dear to me. Ma me va tutamam gatim, utamam gatim. He gets closer to me. Yes. Yes. And yeah, this concept of the meaning, the essence of human life is to perform purposes, yeah, it's like so alien. Yes, completely opposite to what yeah, we're thinking. Yeah. No, it's to enjoy. It's to. It's, yeah, to exactly. <sighs> it's, it's hard, even, you know, when you try, it's still, it's very hard to, to actually move away from that conditioning yes. actually I want to enjoy all the time yes. and kind of get serious about no, I, that's not the point of human life very interesting Shamagori, very interesting you always bring so f- nice points forward but this I, you're, you're, what you did was just now you, you was prescient, it's a prescient statement meaning in a few verses Brahma is going to tell I mean, Krishna, rather, is going to tell Brahma, Brahma, that penance that you did with devotion is my heart. Mm-hmm. And therefore you got me, and here I am, well done, and he shook his hand. <laughs> yeah, I think um, in the process of Krishna consciousness also, very quickly reveals the potency of Krishna consciousness. At the same time, reveals the potency of Maya. Yeah. Because we've been conditioned for millions of births. But the power of Krishna consciousness is in one lifetime. Sometimes we can go back on. But even if we get a wonderful taste for Krishna consciousness, until we have a certain way down the path, there's always that leaning to want to do something else and go back mm-hmm. until you get to a point where you know you really develop that higher taste. 
Well, Prabhupada explained that in detail. He said, until you get to that stage, Maya doesn't leave you alone. <laughs> you know, she sees, oh, here's somebody that's going to escape. Oh, really? You know, that was just a mistake that last time. You know, it was just a fluke. Here, come over here and try this. This is the real thing. Don't you remember how nice this was? Until you get to the point where you're actually at the lotus feet of Krishna, then she retreats. And Krishna tells her, okay, this one's a, I, no, I'm taking care of this one now. You, you can take, take care of somebody else, you know. You got some questions from over in the, out in cyberspace? Yeah, Rati Manjari was typing something, but it, it looks like I can't read the rest of it. There's a way to do that. To retype it? There's a way to do that. Oh. Uh, uh, H- Hannah showed. I didn't. She didn't show me personally. No, there was a read more, but it, it looked like she sent it before it it finished. So we oh, asked I see. her to retype her her comment. I read the Manjari. Could you retype your comment because it's not coming through completely over here? There's still a way to get that. If Hannah was here, she'd figure it out. There, I, I know no it, offense. No there's, offense. There's a read more, but I'm not able to. Yeah, she's retyping it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you talked about Gautu Paranda Mahaprabhu earlier on in the three divisions of the devotee. Yeah. He said if he missed a performance mainly out of fear. Yeah. Could you expand on that? It means, it means that if I don't do, you know, the rules, regulations properly, I'm going to get in trouble. And the Kanishta society that's made of Kanishtas the rule is everything. You know, the rule becomes the master rather than the servant of the real rules, which is always to remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. So if we follow the rules, not for the purpose of always remembering Krishna and never forgetting him, but just for the following the rules themselves, then we, we are, we're, fearing, we're, we're serving out of fear. Yeah. Yes. Prophet adoration and yes. distinction. She's doing it, redoing it. Yeah, she is. This is such a wonderful section of the Bhagavatam. From from the second canto is just unbelievable. All right, got it now. All right. Okay, Rati Manjari is saying is going to do something here. Please accept my humble obeisances. I found there to be many great points in this chapter. For example, that Srila Prabhupada said that there is no necessity of tracing out the history of when the living desired, uh, of when the living desired to lord it over the material world. The also, living being, living entity desired. Yeah. yeah. Also, that Lord Brahma had to be positive. So, what to speak of us? And uh, she she retyped it, but uh, yeah, when the living entity decided to lord it over the material world, many devotees seem to be occupied with this. Yes. Yeah. That was your comment. Yes, that's a very good comment, because uh, first of all, Srila Prabhupada minimized in the, as he did in this one statement in this purport but he minimized it in general many times. And he used to say, it's something that you can't understand from this position, from the conditioned life, you can't understand that. Because 
in the spiritual world where you came from, there's no time. Mm -hmm. So to try to figure out when you came or why or how from here, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible. Therefore, it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. And devotees who try to get the answer, some kind of conclusive, you know, absolute statement on it, which, which is impossible because everyone's different. Mm -hmm. Everyone comes from, you know, different varieties anyway. Uh, then the, what happens is they get, they get caught up in these issues and they get distracted from actually hearing the glories of the Lord and, and relishing the glories of the Lord. Therefore, it says by Krishna, that's Kaviraj Goswami, uh, many times, but it's particularly towards the end of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he said, if one can just hear with faith and love and without argument, then one can get Krishna just by the hearing process. Mm -hmm. And once you get Krishna by the hearing process, all these other distractions and arguments that put us into less than bliss, you know, that's just... And, and what does it do? Re weakens our faith, mm -hmm. reduces our taste for, for devotional service. So this Rupa Goswami is saying, and Sanatana Goswami are explaining the process of surrender. It's not just some emotional, you know, realization all of a sudden, you know, I surrender and that's it. It's, it's a process, the process of surrender. And it begins from accepting those things that are favorable and how you're going to, uh, how you're going to evaluate what's favorable is how it affects your faith, how it affects your, your, your positive attitude towards devotional service and Krishna. If something comes in that you get absorbed in that reduces your faith and causes you to be agitated and always worried about it and always, you know, you know, bothered, it's disturbed, then that should be rejected according to the law of surrender. Nice point, Rati. Rati made a couple other points here. She says... Who in, did? Who did? Rati. Oh, Rati Majorgan. She says, in the example of the mother who gives the mirror to the crying child who wants the moon, so poetic, and so kind that Krishna gave us this world where we can try to fulfill our impossible desire in a dreamlike state. Well, there's two ways to look at it. Of course, he's, he is kind to do that. But we shouldn't go too much further in there because we'll just get absorbed in the dream and we'll think it's okay because Krishna gave it to us and therefore it's okay, but it's not okay. He wants us to come out and be with him. Therefore, that's, that's why he comes. He doesn't just give us a dream. He, he also gives us the reality and he gives us an ability to compare and to select the reality instead of the dream. Yes, seeing it through Krishna's eyes. Yes, very important. Prabhupada gives the, 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 the explanation that it's like, you know, a parent taking the kid to the beach to play, you know, and to play, and the kid enjoys and builds sand castles in the sand and whatever, you know, build, plays with the sand and the buckets and everything. But when it comes time to, to him go home, then the parents just say, okay, let's go. And they go, no, no, I'm not, you know, we want to stay here, you know. So we don't want to be like that. You know, when Krishna comes finally to tell us, actually, there's a real world and we don't belong in a dream, then we should actually, you know, take that as even more kindness. Yes. A couple more here. Uh, Nittai Go Gosai? Pardon my. Nittai Gosai? Yeah. It says, how would a Madhyama Adhikari ideally relate to Kinasta devotees who criticize other systems of bona fide religion. Uh, 
it's too general. The, the question is real general. You'd have to make it a little bit more clear and a little bit more specific because, you know, Srila Prabhupada sometimes criticized persons who were, for, who, were, who, were, who were claiming or pretending to perform other uh, religions but aren't, weren't actually doing it. So he wouldn't criticize the religion itself. He would criticize the persons who were not following their religions and he would point out why they're not following their religions. So that's one thing. The other thing about the Kanishta is, I already, I already made my statement, Prabhupada's statement about the Kanishta, and Krishna's statement is that Udara, Sarva, they're, they're magnanimous. Krishna himself says that even those persons who are Kanishta, they are magnanimous because they're approaching Krishna. So if you define Kanishta as one who is approaching Krishna but still has material desires, then the Madhyam devotee will not only allow them into his association and purify him, but they will, they will also initiate him. There's many statements that say that the Madhyam has compassion for the Kanishta and the non-devotee and initiate the Kanishta and the non-devotee uh, into devotional service. So it's not that they're going to reject them or call them names or, you know, cop an attitude that's going to cause other people to become discouraged. Therefore, Krishna says, you can read it, uh, uh, Nitai, is it? Nitai? Yes. Nitai, Go Nitai Goshai? Mm -hmm. uh, you can read it there in the... Uh, Seventh chapter, Uradak Sarva Evaite, Gyani Twat Vaibame Matam, Astita Sahi Yukta. Uradak Sarva Evaite. It's the seventh chapter, and it is. So the answer to the question is we should see it, as Shamagori said before, through Krishna's eyes rather than our own eyes. Oh, it's Dhanitai. Oh, Haribo Dhanitai. Looking forward to seeing you in a few days. Uh, yeah. I mean, Prabhupada taught us that we should see the devotional service. Here it is, Udadak. It's 18. 718, Krishna says, all these devotees, and when he says all these devotees, he means Tesham Gyani Nitya Yukta, Chatur Bhijanti Mam, four kinds of pious men render devotional service, the distressed, the desire of wealth, the inquisitive, and he who is searching for knowledge of the Absolute. And then in the two verses from there, 18, Krishna says, All these devotees are undoubtedly magnanimous souls, but he who is situated in knowledge of me, I consider to be just like my own self. Being engaged in my transcendental service, he is sure to attain me the highest and most perfect goal. So here, and, and another aspect to the answer to this question is in the next verse. He says, after many births and deaths, he was actually in knowledge, surrenders unto me, knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is. So that means if a person continues to search for the truth, honestly, then eventually he comes to the point where Krishna is uh, all in all in everything and surrenders. So we have to see the persons on the Kanishta stage as headed towards Krishna, and therefore we give them respect. Shamagori. Shamagori. Like he always does. We do not want to miss her deep insights. Wow. You get a little, get a little, get a little promotion there. <laughs> well, she made a lot of comments. Uh, which one you are particularly interested in? Yeah. 
You know, this is this is where we need the splitter. We, but I, I got one, but it didn't work. Yeah. Remember that we got one and we tried to make it work and it didn't because it was the wrong kind of splitter. We'll talk about it. Yeah. So who is it? This Dalmi Thai again? Her? That was uh, Rati Manjari. Oh, Rati. Rati says whichever you like. <laughs> Rati Manjari will be here tomorrow anyway. She'll be able to. Hey Rati, you can ask her. You can ask her directly tomorrow. But other than that, if you can get a splitter that will actually allow us to attach another one of these, you know, so that the sound can go to both, and then the person who's answer, asking, making the comment, can have a microphone also, and that will be better. I can I can see her I can see her brain working already. She's so smart. She's figuring it out. She says I'll look into it. So that she'll, look she'll look into it. Oh good. Thank you very much. And also about Rati, you know. Matt, who's traveling with him now, he also has some some experience. So you're going to come, and you and he and I are going to sit down and talk about th different things that we can do. He's got some ideas too, and you got some ideas too. How to how to make these things, these recordings, and these videos even more accessible to people. And now I'm going to leave. Don't mind. Uh, we, we've, we've gone through another day we've made it through another hearing session one more day one more step back to Godhead one more one more day having executed our vow Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Hare. thank you to all of you out there in cyberspace especially Rati and Dalini Tai who are giving your insights and your wonderful questions to deepen the conversation. And Shamagori, especially, and Priya Kund, and Bhakti Matt, who also made some very nice revelations today, some realizations. So thank all of you, and please, we'll see you again tomorrow night. Same place, same station, here in Wisteria Cottage, you know, in Hode Farm, just outside of Folkestone, between Folkestone and Canterbury, UK, Kent. Hare Krishna. Gaur Premanandi, Hari Hari Bo.